Shalom, my brothers and sisters. And this is part three. The name doctrine and the breakdown of the square root of the beast's name. The T-I-H-S, crystalgram slash monogram of the Roman Catholic Church. So take this time, my brothers and sisters, to pause the screen and look at this image here. Well, we had just learned about the crystal realm in part two. And you look at this crystal realm image of this sunburst image that you see, it has the letter T, an I, H, S, and it has a deeper meaning. But when we take the screw up square root of this image, we should get the power of three. As written in Revelation chapter 16, verse 13. And we have learned from part two that this is the name of the beast, which represents 666. And this image is the sun god that they call the Christ. So take this nine now to pause your screen and to observe this image. And also notice the purple that's behind the T I. HS. So from the intro that we had just watched, <clears throat> you now learn why it's so important to learn the name of the Father and the Son, for it does matter to you who and if you have not watched part one and part two, I highly recommend that you watch both of them before watching this video, because we shall only review the breakdown of the name of the beast. Okay. So a lot of other um, details would not be reviewed in this video that that was reviewed in part one and part two. So as we see here, as written in Exodus chapter 23, verse 13, that it does matter to Yahuwah if we speak another God's name out of our mouth. If you look at the word circumspect, it means to keep guard. I'm sorry, to keep, to guard, to observe or give heed. So he said in all things we are to what? To be on our guard. To observe. So he's telling us to beware. In addition, he said, and make no mention of the names of other gods. So when we look up the word gods, you would come to learn that the lowercase g o d s means judge or ruler. And this is confirmed in these following scriptures Exodus chapter 22, verse 28, Psalms chapter 82, verse 6, John chapter 10, verse 34 to 35. And chapter 1, verse 12, Acts chapter 23, verse 5, and 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse chapter 8, verse 5. For as in the Old Testament, for as in the Old Testament, there are many examples to prove this and to confirm what the scriptures I just gave to you. As you can see, the English word for God is very vague. So you don't know whom. They are coming to you. In other words, you don't know whom they are serving. For they can say, I come in the name of God. Or I come in the name of the Son of God. Again, you, do not, you cannot identify who they serve. Because the English language is too vague. But in the Hebrew language, it's very specific. So examples of God's being a judge or a ruler, can be found in Exodus chapter 7, verse 1, Ruth chapter 2, verse 15, Judges chapter 4, verse 4, and Michael chapter 4, verse 5. Now, in Michael chapter 4, verse 5, that is a proof, that is a future prophecy. So the people who would be under other people shall walk in the name of their rulers. It's there, and that's going to be in a new kingdom. Also, in the book of Judges, um, this would also prove that rulers 
or judges can be man or woman. For this is why Deborah, the prophetess, was a judge. See, when you understand the mystery of being a Nazarite and how it relates to the body of Yahushua HaMashiach, who is the bride of Yahushua and the spiritual temple of Yahuwah, that has received the circumcision of the heart that is not made by man's hands. So when you understand that mystery on how they are in their spiritual Nazarite ship, then you will understand why men and women shall be judges and rulers in the new kingdom. A mystery that many do not understand. Also read Romans chapter 2 for further study. So when you look up this word gods in the Hebrew, it means Elohim, H430. But in the Greek, they would say Theos, which is G2136. And in that language, it can stand for deities, such as other gods. It's got, it can also stand for the Elohim head, which is Jehovah, Yehoshua, and the Ruha HaKadosh, okay, which is the Holy Spirit. And theos can also mean judges, etc. So this is why it's so important for us to look at the origin of words in the King James 1611 Holy Bible, which means, or what we're doing, that we look that we are looking at etymology. That's what etymology means. Okay. For it shall reveal the many lies and deceptions that Satan and his children has spread it throughout the four corners of the earth. So I just want to I'll emphasize this again. Remember the words God and Lord are very broad and vague words. So you will not know whom they are serving. Therefore, we have to apply 1 John chapter 4. Because we can only judge a person by their spirit. Because the masses have been taught these pagan heathen names. For so long, this is all they know. But all praise be to Yahuwah, for he is bringing us out of the darkness and, and into the light and giving us his truth. So while we're in this time of grace and mercy, he is sharing with us his truth so we can teach others about the truth of his name and his son name and their titles. So we must have patience with them for those who are not there. As the, as the Father had patient with us. Okay? So, those who do not have the understanding yet on why we call the Father and the Son name in the Hebrew, pray for them and give it over to the Most High and He will take care of the rest. We are just supposed to what? Plant the Word, which is planting the seeds, and we are, support, and we are supposed to set the example. Okay, so we shall be the light in the world until they can receive understanding at the most high point in time. Okay, now it's very important that you get a copy of the 1611 because there's many clues that the Father left for us to show us what the enemies have done, but also he has given us clues there to, to still reveal his truth. Okay, and to give you understanding on why I prefer to go with Wa for the um, third letter in Yahuwah, which is H3068, is because when you look at your 1611 Bible, you will find that his name that's written in Old English, the third letter is either a V or a U. Okay? So from looking at other sources besides the 1611, I come to find out that Wah was the originator of these letters that we have in our English and modern English language. So it was the original it was the originator of these letters that we have in Old English and Modern English, which are W U V O or Y. Okay. Now when you go back and trace in history, you will learn that in the Greek. The letter F, which is digamma, and the letter Y, which is upsilon, came from the Hebrew letter Y, okay? And both of them have the same number, for Y represents six. Then when it was transferred in the 
Latin, it um, developed the Latin letters such as F and V. And as time went over, that's how we got these other letters. Okay. So Y means, the, the Y stands for the number six, and it means nail, bound, peg, hook, etc. So now this will give you understanding why I prefer using Yahuwah in, in the way I spell our father name. Also take a look at the punctuation because you will learn how I was able to get the punctuation was looking at other names that came from his name. Okay. And this FYI, I just want to bring to your attention. This is the difference between Hebrew and English. When someone else is coming in another God's name, they would say by L, which is H1167. And that particular word would stand for husband, Lord, or a foreign God. When we address our Holy Father in heaven, we would say Adon, which is H113 or Adonne, okay, which is my Lord, my master, or king or husband, okay? Do you see the difference between the English language and the Hebrew language? And do you see how the wolves can hide themselves in sheep clothing? This is why it's so important that we test the spirit by the spirit. We need to see that person's soul and what spirit has adjoined to that soul. It's either going to be the spirit of Yahushua HaMashiach or it's going to be the spirit of the anti-Messiah. Okay? So this is why it's so important. So this is why the Father had prophesied in Hosea chapter 2 or why his people call him by Eli because they had a history of being into um, idolatry and worshiping other gods. So in the new kingdom, we're no longer going to call him that anymore, my people. We're going to be broken from that curse. We're going to be calling him Ishai, which means my husband. Okay. So there's many evidence in the Bible to show you how to get the fallen name. For you can find Hugh, Yahoo, and many other people names that's listed in the Bible. And there's other examples as well. I also was able to get a um, chance to add in the, the um, pronunciation for Saul and Paul name. Take this time to pause your screen to look at that. Okay. And I also want to add this because I didn't mention it too heavily in part two. The word jewelry is Judea. Okay. And you can find it in Daniel chapter 5, verse 13, Luke chapter 23, verse 5, and John chapter 7, verse 1. So jewelry is just another name for Judea. Take this time now to pause your screen to look at the additions that I added, okay? Also, I learned that Judea means he shall be praised. And yada, that's a word, that's one of the root words, okay, means to praise, so when you, you know when you trace back from the Greek to the Hebrew, it'll give you a lot of um, root words, and it's important to look at these root words so you can understand how did Yahud, how did Yahuda get its name? And when you read scriptures, you will learn that his name means praise Yahuwah. So you can see that. The next thing I like to um, reinforce again is that INR is the acronym of the Latin words that was written above Yahushua's cross. And you can see in this title in Latin that it's really close to the word Judean. Please excuse my phone. <laughs> okay. And we all we also are familiar that the word Jew did not really come into existence until the 1800s, which is now and the, the 1800 century is the 1700s. So the correct word to call the Hebrew Israelites should have been Judeans and not Jew, but that word came actually from the French, 
which translated into uh, modern English today as Jew. Okay, so take this time to pause your screen to look at that. And then take this time to pause your screen to look at the message on the wooden cross. Okay. I also learned that, and you don't see too many Hebrew. Okay, sorry about that, my family. I've been trying to make this video, so been having several interruptions, but let us get on back on track. Um, so what I was mentioning in the, in the clip that, that you was listening to is that I do not see many Hebrew Israelites talking about how the name Israel came about. For when you go back and you look at the concordance 83478, you will see that Israel is made up of sever and L, H8280, and L is H410. But doing a further study and looking at the Y in Israel also lets me know that Yah is a part of this um of this name of of my nation. Okay, so. When you look at pronunciation, you know, you look at how Sarah is pronounced and you look at how L is pronounced and you see the long line over A and it lets me know it's, it's a long sound L. And then you look at how Ya is, is pronounced, which give me um, the belief, the, the correct way that um, is the correct way that Israel should have been pronounced is, is probably Yasadrael. But I would have to do more research on this. Another thing that I don't see some of my Hebrew is like brothers and sisters talking about is how this name relates to the prophecy that was given to Sarah in Genesis chapter 17, verse 15 through 16. For it's written that many, um, it is written that Sarah shall be the mother of nations of which kings shall come out of. Now, this has a spiritual meaning to the body of Yahushua HaMashiach for those who understand the mystery and for those who have watched the um, videos that I had given from part one and part two. If you have watched those videos, do you will understand what Genesis 17 verse 15 through 16 was telling you? For the word Sarah means to have power, okay, as a prince. And then when you looked up L, I mean, I'm sorry. And then when you look up Israel, it means a prince that has power with, with Yahuwah and with men and prevail. And that's found in Genesis chapter 32, verse 28. So I thought that was very interesting. Okay. Uh, another thing I would like to bring out is with the name of Yahushua, who is the son of Yahuwah. If you look at how his name is spelled in Hebrew, the Y-H-W-S-H, -S and that's like an accent right there to represent the um, the I-N, okay? When you look at his name, if you look at the, the um, look at Hosea name, you can see his name, a part of, of, of Yahushua's name, because we know Hosea means salvation, Okay. When you also look at the father name, Yehovah, we can see the Y-H-W in the son name. And then when we look at um, Yahshua, which is a contraction for Yahushua, and in, and in the English tongue, they would say Yeshua, okay? We can see that this contraction is also a part of Yahushua's name, as well as when we look at this word, Yasha, that means to save. You can see the Y-S-H with the uh, accent to represent the I-N. I mean, I mean to represent that that letter is accented. Oh, uh, you can see that also in the son name Yahushua. Okay. And I had a mistake in part two in the way the Greek spell Joshua and the correction should be I-O-S-U-A-H, which is in the Hebrew chapter 4, 8 side note. And that is the proof of how Joshua name should have been spelled in the Greek. So when you compare it to 
this Jesus, you can see a big difference between them, a very big difference. So this is how we know that the heathens inserted this name. And when you do a further study, you will learn that it is the son of Zeus, who is actually the son of Satan, the anti-Messiah. Okay. So I'm scrolling down a little bit more. I do want to emphasize this part when you're dealing with the Greek word Messiahs. When you compare John 1 verse 41 to Daniel 9 to 25, you can see that the Greek word Messiahs should have been Messiah. Because what they did here, they said the Messiahs, which is being interpreted to Christ. Now, you know, that don't even match up. They inserted that word. See, the Messiah, which is being interpreted, the Messiah, the Prince. So if you look at the Old Testament with the New Testament, that is proof to let you know that they did some manipulation. OK, and I want to take you to the strong concordance, because, again, I would want I want you to hear how this name is pronounced. This false name that they, they, that they had given to us for the son of Yahuwah. Strong's G 2424. Jesus. Jesus. And then after hearing that, just by the sound of that, you can tell that is not Yahushua's name. It don't even come close. And then when you go to John chapter 1, verse 41. I want you to hear the Greek word for Messiah. Strong's G 3323, Messias. Messias. Okay. And compare it to how the word Christ is originally pronounced. Strong's G 5547, Christos. Christos. So we can see. And the way they spell Christos is spelled with an X, which will explain why we see them representing Christ with an X or representing Christmas with an X. Okay. These are all paganistic stuff. Okay. see here let's keep scrolling down till we get to the area that we need to get to so basically what you have seen what what the heathens have done they basically hellenize the word that was written in the ancient scrolls and the king james 1611 bible so they did a very good job of of infiltrating us and giving us the lies okay and um, just pause your screen for the updates that I did with with Hosea, with the pronunciation, as with with um, Yah Yahshua, right here. So you can see how I was able to get that. Now we're coming to the lesson, the breakdown of the beast name. And as we can see on this screen here, this is the beast image. Okay. And it confirms what was written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 17 through 18. For verse 18 says, Here is wisdom. Let him that have understanding count the number of the beasts, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. King James 1611. So I want you to really look at this image here. Did they call this the sunburst image or the blazing sun? And if you know anything about letters or what we just talked about, their origin, this cross looks like a lowercase t. OK, and, and when you do a further study, you would come to learn that it represents an X, like a cross, like a cross. You know, you know, you pay tic-tac-toe and it also represents these of uh, the Greek letter tall okay no it's hebrew no i know one of the greek letters is tall 
but we'll go further down. I'll give you the exact names, but it represents two of the Hebrew letters. Okay. When you, when you do a further study on it. Now, now the name, the image and the number of the beast 666, which we know is Jesus Christos. Okay. Who is the son of Satan, the son of perdition and the anti Messiah. He has many other names, and he is known as Baal, Tammuz. And if you look at this purple in this image, and they call this the sun disk image right here in the center, you will see that this color purple represents a 33 degree Freemason or Grand Mason. Okay, so we see some masonry in this too because you know the masonry based their beliefs or their um ways off of religion they look at judaism with the talmud and the kabbalah and they also look at christianity too so you see how everything's tying together so when you look at revelations chapter 13 it was talking about let me see. Well, in Revelation chapter 13, it was talking about an image, right? So I took this time to, to look up the word image in the Greek. And I cannot say this word, but it starts with an E. And it's G1504. Okay. And what is said on the strong concordance is that image means the image of the Son of God in which true Christians are transformed. Is likeness not only to the heavenly body but also to the most holy and blessed state of mind, which Christos possesses, or a likeness such as literary statue, profile, or fig figuratory representation, resemblance, such as an image. So what this is basically saying, my people, that the anti-Messiah, the Christos will appear to them shining as the sun or can be of a high regard and placed on a high pedestal by men. Okay, so either he's going to be looked up as a as a great man who can do great signs and wonders and have powers or or he may appear to them to be a shiny bright light. Okay, so. When you look up this um, word in the Greek, that's what it means. It's not only just pertaining to pictures and to idols and to imagery, but it also gives us the, the deeper understanding that whomever this anti-Messiah is, he's going to be on a high pedestal. He's going to be worshipped by man. Okay. Now, image in the Hebrew can be an idol or image or anything made by Yahuwah. And the Hebrew word for that is Petzel H6459. Okay. So when you read Revelation 13, when it's talking about image, we see that with the heathens, they have more than one image to represent the anti-Messiah. Okay. And you will see that their followers would take on their likeness, their ways. Okay. Again, we have to test the spirit by the spirit. Now, to break the code that was written on this sunburst image, which is the T I H S, you have to keep this in mind when you're trying to understand of how to get six six six. It's going to be a number, okay? Because you know Greek, um, Latin, and Hebrew letters also mean numbers. It's also going to be a uh, letter e equivalents like letters go equal each other okay for example look at the wa look at what letters that came out of that and lastly it's going to be based on letter resemblance in other words the letters don't relate to one another but they look like one another and this is how you can crack the code of getting the beast name which is 666 now what you see below is an older image of a sunburst okay but the difference with this image compared to the other one because it's very hard to see if they have s f s on this 
But in the older images of the sunburst or the blazing sun, they would have SFS. And when you do your homework, you're going to learn it is the magic square of the sun. So it's, ta- it's telling you it's taking the square root of the sun. Hmm. Okay. Which bring us back to the image that this is the symbol of the Christians that they use to represent Jesus Christos. Okay. So when I take the square root of this image, because this is the sun right here, you see, you see the beams, the blazing sun. And I take the square root of the beast name, I get three. So you're probably wondering how did the world is sister you get it and get that? Okay. Well, when you look up SFS, you will learn that it stands for Sine Fraud Sewell without fraud on his or her part. So it kind of reminds you when I when I hear this Latin phase. And what it means is like you can sin without being at fault. Okay. Also, when you go back from the English letter that you see and break these letters down, you learn that they represent either a number or a letter that would be translated into 666. Okay. So we're going to start with the letter T because I want to show you how it's able to get the square root of this image that you see here, which is number three. So the square root of the Christian symbol of the sunburst with the beast name T-I-H-S, the square root of that is three. Okay. Okay. So for some of us, we got to scratch our brains again and remember what we learned in high school. <laughs> okay. So I will put a link in the video description box so you can refresh your mind about square roots and how to do it. Okay. So now we're going to look at the uh, the letter, the, the, the letter T that was in the beast image. Okay. So the lower, so, so, so the lowercase T we equal nine. And it also represents the cross, which we see here, which is the X and the cross. Okay. So if you take the square root of nine, you would get three. Okay. And this is how I was able to do it. When you trace the letter T in the Greek, it means tall. All right. And then you'll learn that tall came from the Hebrew letter tall. And you look at the symbol for that Hebrew letter, it's an X or a plus. When you translate that letter into English, you get TH or T. Okay. So this is how I was able to understand that the lowercase T that you see on the IHS image that's above the H represent the cross. Okay. That's very important to know. Then the second step of the breakdown of this letter T. I also learned that this letter T comes from the Greek letter theta. Okay. And here's a picture of what theta will look like in several ways. Okay. Also, theta comes from the Hebrew letter tet. And tet has a circle and a cross. And its value is nine. So this is how I was able to get the number nine. Do you see where we're going with this? Remember, I told you that Hebrew letters have meanings, okay? Because it's going to tell you a lot about this NT Messiah. So again, when I take the square root of nine, I would get three, the power of three. And the power of three relates to Revelation 16, verse 13. And there will be a video in the description box to give you more understanding of how powerful this power of three is, okay? But when you look at the Hebrew letter for tall, which is the X, okay, that represent the cross, it's telling you it is a mark, sign, X, or cross. It means ownership, to seal, covenant, join two things together, the last. Now, this is telling us a lot because guess what? 
in these last days, when the anti-Messiah reveal himself to the world, many are going to join themselves to him, okay, by coming in covenant with him, and they're going to receive his mark. This is very important. Also, with the Hebrew uh, letter Tet, which is meaning it represents nine, it means a snake to round me to surround, to twist, a twisting or calling. And what does remind you of of the children of Satan? They always twisting the most high word. This is why I explained why they put a circle around the X right here, because it's represented the snake circling around the covenant and twisting the most high word. Take this time now to pause the screen to, to review what we just went over. So now that we got an understanding of what the lowercase t is, now we're going to look at the, uh, at the IHS. Now, in part two, we learned that IHS is actually Jesus, which is IES. Okay. And there's many other breakdown for this letter. I'm not going to read this word for word, but just take, you know, take this time to pause your screen. I'm just going to go over the highlights. So we already know it is a crystal gram, which means a Christian symbol. And when you combine letters like this, it is called a monogram. Okay. And this is why you would see it comes as, as IHS or INRI or CHI hyphen row. OK, so they have many different subtitles to represent Jesus Christos. OK. Also, FYI, when you study the Greek letter sim Sigma, it, it has many different forms. It can be the letter S, where it can look like the letter S, but also it can look like a, um, a lunate um, Sigma, which mean is. It looks like a C in Latin. Okay. Let me see if I need to mention anything from here. So other contractions that they also developed for Jesus Christos, it are in the Greek letters are I-H, okay, I-C, or I-H-C, okay. In the Greek, you see how his name is spelled. Okay, you see how Jesus is spelled in Jesus. It also can be XC, XP, XPC to represent Christos. Okay, so let me repeat this again. The letters to represent Jesus are HI, I mean IH. I C or I H C the rep the letters to represent crystals are X C X P X P C. I'm going to mean a hard setting all these letters. Sometimes make your head want to, want to spin. <laughs> so you see how they made it so complicated and why it's not, it wasn't that easily to be seen, but yet it was before our eyes. And while I was talking about, a lunate form of the Greek sigma, it is often represented by the C, okay? So take this time now to pause the screen and read this word for word. Now we get into the breakdown of the IHS and see what the letters represent. Now, this is something you want to pause your screen and you got to take your time because I'm, I'm going to be honest, my family. Because when you look... When you break down the IHS, you will learn it's a combination of the Latin, the Hebrew, and the Greek. And because these letters go back and forth, either it's, it's by a number that joined them together, or it's by a letter that joined them together, or it's by a letter resemblance that joined them together. So I want to say this and keep it short and not long for you. When you look at the Greek letter eta, it's represented by H. Okay. And in the Latin, it is written as H. But in the Hebrew, it's Chet. Okay. When you look at the Greek letter epsilon, which is the Y, 
Okay, I'm sorry. I moved, I was jumping a step ahead. When you look at the letter F, Epsilon, it's usually rep represented by the letter E. And in the Roman, that's what it looks like in the E. Okay. Or this curvy E. And it comes from the Hebrew letter Het. Okay. Now, when you look at Sigma, okay, there's three symbols can, that can represent, <laughs> actually there's four things that, that can represent Sigma, okay? And take this time to pause the screen and look at this. This is one of them right here. This is the second one. And this is the third one, okay? In Latin, it's represented by S. And it comes from the Hebrew letter Shin, okay? And remember, in Latin C, it's equal to an S that represents sigma. All right. Now, this Greek letter has no letter in Latin. All right. So I'm just going to say, when you see X, I'm going to say Xi. And this is how it's represented. What you see here, the three lines. And when you see this, like this curvy E light with a little tail to come to the end, that's actually, actually represented as snake, which we'll talk about later in this video. OK, so it means the number 60. And this is the reason why I mentioned this number because it's very important, but it has no letter in the Latin, but it comes from the Hebrew letter. Shimp, I think it's forgive my tongue. I'm going to spell it S-A-M-E-K-H. And when you translate that letter, it come out to be a letter S and it means 60. OK. Now, when you look in the Greek letter chai, it is represented by an X and it means 600. So when it's translated into Latin, it's represented by the letter X, but there's no Hebrew letter for this one. OK. And this brings us to. Let's see where to start at. This brings us to digamma, which is very important because digamma has several different forms. You see F. The cursive C, or it was also called the lunate C, okay? And as far as a number, it's represented like a S, which means for number six. Now, digamma is also called stigma, okay? And it's because it combines sigma and tall together. This is something you want to keep in the back of your mind. The reason why digamma is also known as stigma, because stigma combines the Greek letter Sigma and tall. This is how you get that little um, S right here that you see. Okay. And it goes back to the Hebrew letter Wa. Okay. And Wa represent the number six. So here you see it's mostly due to a number right here. Okay. Now what we talked about earlier about Wa. That was um, dealing with the different letters that come from it. OK, so in the Phoenician letter, you would see Y as a Y. OK, in the Phoenician Hebrew. OK, but in our Hebrew, you see it more as a hook. This is um, my belief. Yeah, this is Paleo Hebrew. OK, take this time to pause the screen because we ought to been over that part before. So digamma is the Greek equivalent letter to stall slash sick stigma. And that's, this is a picture of it, or what star looks like. And we ought to just mention that it, it equals to six and the letter S, okay? And sigma means sign, which we're going to talk about further in this video. So other letters that, that mean six as well can be F, O, and X, dealing with the pagan letters. And FYI, for those who had the King James 1611 Bible, you will learn that when you see Hosea spell, for instance, it's spelled with an F. And actually, when you go back and you translate letters, you will learn that the F is actually representing the modern day S that we see today in the King James Version copies. OK, if you have the original, I'm talking about the, the original 1611 copy, you will see that the letter um, F is written in place of the letter S. Okay. Take this time to pause the screen.
what this Wikipedia statement right here is just stating what I mentioned to you before, how they got stigma. Well, how stigma got a symbol for it comes from sigma and tau. Those two Greek letters. And last right here, we have the Greek letter I, okay, which is iota, okay? And when it's translated into Latin, it becomes an I and J. And you go back to the Hebrew, it's represent yard. And both these um, letters equals 10, okay? And which when you think about X, I mean, when you think about what J is, is representing Jesus and, and Jesus is the Christ. So this is what leading us back to how Christ is representing by an X, okay, which is known as the cross or, or the T. And the room and the Roman numeral for 10 is X. Do you see that? <laughs> how everything's connecting together. So the thing you're probably asking when you're writing this out, when you're looking at the IHS slash IES, you can see where 600 come from because it comes from the Greek letter Chai, okay? And Chai is X, and X is Christ, and Christ is Jesus. That's in Greek for I. So you can see where that coming from. The same thing with S. You, you see where S comes from Sigma, and Sigma letter resemble stigma and stigma value is equal to six okay so we can see that but what about this e or eta which is h because when you tie it back into the greek it is xi and xi has no letter but it's equal to 60. so here's the breakdown okay so we already talked about number one let's look at number two eta okay when you look at eta it has a long vowel sound see that curvy e light okay and it comes and when it's translated into latin it becomes the letter h okay as we see here and we already know that xi has no letter so what we have to do is when we look at the letter e because we know E is equal to H, okay? It resembles the Hebrew letter Shin. See how that W is like upside it and the E is to the side, okay? So we know Shin is, is I mean, we, we know Sigma comes from Shin. And you see that E sign right there? And we know sigma also relates to stigma because of the S shape right here, this literature that we see, because this literature is made of sigma and tau. All right. So when we translate into English, we get the letter S and all of this come from. And the letter S comes from the Hebrew word S-A-M-E-K-H, which can be a C or S. And that is this symbol right here. So we learned that the Hebrew letter that you see is equal to 60. And this Hebrew letter gave rise to this Greek letter, Xi. Do you see that little curvy little E right there? And this is how H that we see in the uh, name of Jesus becomes 60. It's based on letter resemblance and going through each letter and finding what other letter it is related to or or what letter is in in I can't say that word or what other letter equals to it either in appearance or by number. OK, so this is how I was able to get the breakdown. So it's based on letter resemblance. H equals E equals Sigma equals the letter S equals the Hebrew saying, I might not pronounce it that correctly, but equal to Hebrew, Sefk, which equals 60. Okay. So when you look at the beast name or I H S, we have a Latin letter, it's just X 600. We have a Hebrew letter, which is S60, and we have a Greek letter, which is S6, and this is how we got the beast name. Now we're going to look at the square root of this. 
Well, I'll discuss with you how we get the square root of nine, which is three, because three has to time itself two times. Now, when you look at when they come in 666, what well, they come into power three, because we know if we add two to itself three times, we get six, right? Same thing. We know if we add one to itself three times, we get three. So when it say they come into power three, you got to understand what's truly going on here. For we know this anti-Messiah is coming under the anointing of Satan. See, he has the powers of darkness. Okay. And we also know there's going to be a great deception that the Most High is going to put on the people who are not sealed by the blood of the Lamb. And they're going to fall for this great deception. This is how powerful it is. And then we also have the anti Messiah spirit in the earthly realm that are dwelling in many people. They have joined in covenant with this anti um spirit. So take this time now to pause to look at this. Because the FSS in Latin is dealing with the square root of the sun. Which remind me about a pyramid. And the reason why I mentioned this, this all ties back to the ancient Egyptians and the ancient Babylonians, such as Nimrod and them, or what they worship. See, it's the reason why they operate in triangles, because when you look at a pyramid, what is the base of a pyramid? A square. And they always equate their God, like, like whoever is the sun, such as Tammuz, they always equate the sun to the, um, to the sun. In other words, they call him a sun god. So when you take the square root of the sun god, you would get three. That's the kind of power that this anti-Messiah is coming in and how powerful he is. And to understand the power of three, I highly recommend that you watch that video, The Meaning of the Frogs in Revelation chapter 16, verse 13, to understand how great a power that this one is coming, as well as the power of the dragon and the power of the beast. Okay. Now, here are some symbols. For the abbreviations, I mean, here are some abbreviation symbols of the beast name. So you want to take this time and pause your screen to look over that. So we already talked about the most common one. I just want to mention this again. We got IH, IC, IHC. Okay. That's for Jesus. For Christos, we have XC, XP, XPC. All right. And when the sigma is in a lunate form, you're going to see a C instead of an S. All right. And again, the beast name come out to be Chi, Xi, Stigma. When you go back and translate all the letters. All right. Now, I do want to read this one. We're going to talk about the Chi row for the down. But that was one of the symbols that Constantine used in his army as well as the Catholic Church. But he but it says here, when you study about the Chiro, it says that often the P is formed to look like a shepherd crook and like a cross, symbolizing Jesus Christos as good shepherd of his flock, the Christian church. Therefore, although the Chiro and Libram are not originally symbols, they became closely associated over time. Okay, so what they were basically saying, originally this symbol was used for something else, but it came a part of Christianity. And when you um, take a look of the Chiro and how it's written, it really remind me, family, of, of the ox, of the Egyptian. When you see it, you can tell that the Greeks and the Romans got everything from the ancient Egyptians, as well as the ancient Egyptians got everything from the ancient Babylonians. Because all the other nations was into worshiping the other gods who was the host of heaven. So it makes sense why everybody was kind of doing the same thing. And we all talked about why we see X in Christmas. Um, most importantly, that this abbrevi these abbreviations, especially the IHS and the IC and the IHC is very popular among the Latin Christians, the um, Protestants and the Roman Catholics. Okay.
Now, I do want to point this out that it says here in the um, in this site that I got from because the Latin alphabet letters I and J was not systematically distinguished until the 17th century. JHS and JHC are equivalent to IHS and IHC. So the Latin letters of I and J was not distinguished until the 17th century, which is the 1600s, which explains why you don't see it in the King James 16 Bible, because they won't for that. They was not before replacing the I with the J. It was only until you you see um, the I replaced with the J in the King James Version. And that's very important to remember. Okay. Let's see here. Now we get into the next abbreviation, which we ought to discuss right here. He's also represented by a fish, which is I C H T H U S or I C H T H Y S. Okay. And when you break this down, you know, it is represented by three letters I C T slash I X T. So right here, you can see what the Greek symbols are. You got an I, you got an X, and you got a theta. And theta looks a lot like the Hebrew letter tet. You got the circle and the X. Okay. So you got the snake going around the circle to represent twisting. Mm -hmm. So you can see a lot of resemblance between the Greek and the Hebrew um, picto. Um, let me see. What's the best word? Um, between the Greek and the Hebrew letters. Okay. Now in Easter Orthodoxy, they use ICXC to represent um, Jesus Christos. Okay. And how they got that is that the first and last letter of each of the words oh, comes from this word here that represent the fish. If I make sure I got everything. Yeah. Represent the fish right here. Okay. And let's see here. So you can see it written as this. That's another version right here. This fish symbol right here is also written as this. That you see my crystals going across. And which represent the translation of the lunate sigma. Because remember, they would take the sigma signal and replace it with a C. Okay. So when you see images of the beast, whether it's the sunburst or whether it is Jesus Christos, you can see these letters being split on each of his side. You can see IC on one side and you see XC on another side, okay, which come from the, or the Eastern Orthodox letter for IC, XC to represent the fish. Also, on another site, you will see them adding the word Nika, which means conquers, okay. So again, you have the fish symbol here. I mean, the fish letter here. And then you have the um, this word, Nika, right here. Uh, and it means Jesus Christos conquers. And to see it fully spread out in the Greek is right here. And then you already have seen, we already discussed how that ICXC represents this form of the fish, how it's spelled. And in that source here that I'm going to list in the video description box, we're just talking about another image of, of, of their Christos. And what they were saying that in this image, that crystal right hand is shown um, in a pose that represents the letters I, C, X, and C. So take this time to pause your screen on that. Now to something a little bit more interesting because do you know that the strong concordance do have a reference numbers to the beast uh, name which is 666 and that can be found in g5516 okay which is chai xi sigma
So with Sigma, which we had talked about before, that's a combination of Sigma and Tau. In a strong concord, it means a mark, prick in end or brand upon the body. To ancient or any usage, slaves and soldiers bore the name or the stamp of their master or commander branded or prick. And prick means cut into their bodies to indicate what master or general they belong to. And they were even some devotee who stamped themselves in this way with the token of their gods. Remember when I talk about gods, it's actually mean their rulers or their masters or their king. So stigma comes from a primary stick toes. So that means to stick such as prick. OK, and we just learned that prick means what cut as a cross or stutteros, meaning a pole or post. OK, so what it's saying is like a, that that sign is like an X. OK, so a verse of example can be found in Galatians chapter six, verse 17. And again, read Michael chapter four, verse five, because you will see in the new kingdom the people will walk in the name of their ruler, but in the English tongue, they would say God. Okay. Also, FYI, um, a cross is, is Thoros, which is G4716, which come from this Greek word, G2476. And this Greek root word that, that Thoros come from means to cause or make stand, to put, I mean, to place, to put or to set. Okay. And here's an image of what and Staros image look like. Okay. And why they would say it's more like a pole or a pole, because you see a long pole right here. And then you see an X and then you see this courier E symbol. Okay. Which represent the, the um, Zai and is actually representing a snake, which we'll talk about later. And we know that X is Chai for Greek. All right. And the I is Iota. All right. So we just talked about this symbol here and going back to 666 with the Greek concordance that we talked about. It was in Revelation chapter 13. I um, just want to emphasize again, Chai is 600. Zion Greek is 60 and stigma is six. So that's how we get the name of the beast. So when you look at the Hebrew letters, Wa, because Wa is equal to stigma, which represent the number six, it means a nail, a peg, a hook, joining together, making secure, becoming bound, nail two. So you're probably asking yourself, how did this relate to the anti-Messiah? Well, I'm going to give it to you after we go over the next Hebrew letter, which is number two. And it means a prop to support, prop, aid, assist, a slow twisting or turning aside like a prop plant. So it's a slow tissue like turn aside. Kind of remind me of a snake, don't it? Yes, slow tissue turn aside. So this is why this image right here. This, this curvy E with a little tail, mind you of a snake. Think about how a snake do is pray. Okay. So the meaning of all of this with the anti-Messiah is that when you adjoin yourself to him by receiving the anti-Messiah spirit, you are becoming bound in darkness and the twisting of the and the you shall not receive the truth of Yahuwah's word because it's being twisted. Read John chapter 8, verse 43 to 45, Luke chapter 1, and Acts chapter 26, verse 18. So those who do not have the spirit of Yahushua HaMashiach in them will only have, will have the anti-Messiah spirit in them. And I'm going to emphasize this, my people. The only way you can receive the spirit of Yahushua to be in you, in or in other words, to dwell in you. 
you have to receive salvation and, and baptism in his name. And that includes water baptism, my people. Do not listen to the anti-messiahs who preach against the water baptism because the lamb and the apostles set the example. I recommend that you read the whole book of Acts because that is proof that they, they still continue the water baptism. And read Mark chapter 16. Now this bring us to the letter that I mentioned earlier, the Chiro, and how I say it looked like an aunt's. Well, here's a picture right here. And I wish me good luck. I'm going to try to blow this up. So you can really see this. Okay. I'm going to try one more time. You know how computers are. It really looked like an ounce, this chiro here. And that's one of these are these are one of the um Christian symbols that they are using today from the heathens. I'll bring it back down because you know our computers are it's not gonna work with me. Okay. So they have taken heathen symbols. And start using it in their so-called religion called Christianity, which is basically, again, about sun worship. And I'm going to be honest, my family. When, when I started studying the breakdown of the beast name, this made my stomach turn. <sighs> to see what the heathens have done. Okay. Chiro. Now, Chiro came from... Constantine using this symbol in his military, okay? And it was a standard for them. And another name for it was Liber Rum, all right? Also, there was earlier symbols before the Chiro, such as the Starogram. You see the P on top of the T. And then you see the XI monogram. You see the I with the X. Kind of remind you of what, like a wheel, Okay? Now, this is something that I didn't was not even aware of, but it makes sense because when you see that King James 1611 or any books that's written by the Greeks and Romans, they would use like a mark to let you know something was, was significant, which is kind of explains why we use the asterisk today or why we use the, the, um, the X symbol to mark something to let us know it's important. Well, this is where this come from. Because it says that in pre-Christian times, the Chiro symbol was also to mark a particularly valuable or relevant passage in the margin of a page, abbreviating Christon good. Some coins of, of Ptolemy the third, the E word, were marked with Chiro. So when they're marked Chiro, it's letting you know it is good. <laughs> Now, do you see how this word Christos, which is Christ, and Jesus, how, now you can see what the heathens have done. They have done a number on taking the on taking Yahushua's name out of the Bible and also replacing his title with these pagan words. For Yahushua HaMashiach is the Messiah. He is not the Christ which in the Greek tongue they call Christo. He is not that, my family. <laughs> I'm telling you. Now let's bring us to this image of the fish. Okay, so I'm going to show you how you get the power three out of the fish. Okay, so a lot of this information we don't went over. So I'm just going to touch on the highlights. Um, let me bring it back down so you can really see the image. Take this time now to pause the screen. Okay. And... How they make the symbols by, by two intersecting arcs. Okay. Two arcs come together. All right. Now, this is something that you really want to be familiar with when this was being used. Because dates give you a lot of important information. In the second century AD, which was in the year of 100s, my people, was when the first appearance of this symbol in Christian art and literature date. So remember, Yahushua HaMashiach was crucified 32 AD. We didn't have the symbol. Hebrew Israelites didn't have the symbol. Okay? This symbol comes from the heathens. 
Let me continue to read. It had become popular among them by the late second century and spread widely in the third and fourth century. And when you look at the third and fourth century, it was from the years of 200 to 300 AD. So it's, it started in second century, um, second century AD and started growing like wildfire in the third and fourth century. Okay. The, the symbolism of the fish itself may have its origins in pre-Christian religious imagery. See, that's telling you already that this symbol existed way before Christianity. It was used in the heathens' religions. Okay? So, this imagery relates to Dagon, the fish god. And you can find him mentioned in the Bible. I'll read Joshua 15, verse 41. Chapter 19, verse 27, that's done with, with the temple or house of Dagon. Also read Judges chapter 16, 1 Samuel chapter 5, and 1 Chronicles chapter 10, verse 10. And 1 Maccabees chapter 10, verse 83 through 84, and chapter 11, verse 4. For Dagon was referenced by the ancient Assyrians as the father of Baal. Hmm. And when you look at Dagon, it comes from the Hebrew word Dag, which is H1709. And Dag means fish. Now, Dagon reference number is H1712. So in the days of antiquity, Dagon was associated with El among the Canaanites. Okay. Which kind of makes sense because look at Satan. Satan is often compared to Leviathan, H3882. And when you look it up, it means a dragon. And a dragon is a large aquatic reptilian animal. And the spellings of Dagon and dragon are closely related. So when you look at the breakdown of Christos, Christo is, is Tammuz, which is Baal. And Baal is the son of Satan. Therefore, he is the anti-Messiah. So do you see how this all relates and why the Roman Catholics are into fish worship? It's there. The evidence is there. And how they had made um, Christianity and have Christianity and having Christians to carry this symbol that you see here. It's something. And they don't even know it has nothing to do with the Bible. Of him, you know, with with the fish and the bread, because it was if it had something to do with the fish and the and the two loaves of bread, then they would have shown two loaves of bread in that symbol. See, this is how they get you. You got to read the whole word. See, you have see if they want to represent it that or what or what Yahushua did for the people, they would have a representation of two loaves and two fish, but they didn't. They had this pagan symbol. Telling you something. So here's the uh, meaning of, of the fish letters. When you look at it, I'm going to bring this up some so you can see that and pause your screen. So um, starting here at number two, I represent Jesus. CH represents Christos. Okay. Um, the TH represents Theta. Okay. And the U or Y represent Upsilon. And the S, when you see on the E looking sound, or the C represents Sigma. Okay. Now, here's how you get the power of three. There was a man named by Augustine who wrote in his Civite D. And he said in his notes that the generating sentence of this Greek word, Okay, F that represents the fish has 27 letters. So if you take three times three times three, you would get what? 27. Which in that age indicate power. So the only way you can get 27, my people, I went back because I look at the different spellings. Of, of the fish name because what they did it they took the, the the first letter of each word it was written in Greek but when you spell it fully out in Cohen Greek and I counted each letter I got 27 letters and you have to count 
the um subscribe the subscript letter you see the k and the h and the t and the h you have to count that and i got 27 letters and when you um look at the power three is that when you take nine times three which is nine plus nine plus nine equals 27 and we um, and we know that a nine is basically an up down six. Do you see how this relate <laughs> to the beast's name? I'm telling you, it's it's really something. And I do want to read this because this came from Wikipedia. It says a fourth century AD adaptation of fish as a will contains the letters, got um the Greek letters. I, X, theta, epsilon, and sigma superimposed such that the result resembles an eight-spoke wheel. Remember that wheel and the circle around the wheel represent to them a snake. So that snake going to wrap around you and coil around you and bound you in darkness and keep you from the truth of Yahuwah. Hmm tell you so we know the th in this fish word so you can see here this one's talking about theta okay and i forgot to mention what this acronym all means it means let me make sure i get this right in english jesus Christo, son of god savior okay that's what it means so when you take theta remember I, when we were talking about earlier is represented the T and, it, and the T has um, means nine as well. And you take the square root of nine, you get three, which is the power of three. Okay. And then you take nine and you multiply it by the power of three and you'll get 27. And if you look at nine being upside down, you know, three nines, we give you six, six, six. Okay. So take this time now to pause the screen because what I did, I gave the breakdown of how you can get 666 out of the fish name. <laughs> I'm telling you, you can do it. It can be done. So when you know that, what happened is it comes to the breakdown of T-I-H-S when you do your breakdown. And let me, let me walk you through it because, it, yes, it's a lot. And you probably saying, whoa, <laughs> I don't know who get this. Okay. When you look at the fish letters, okay, I'm talking about the full letters. We know chai is 600, theta is 9, which represents the cross of the T, okay? We know osalon is Y, which is going back to the Hebrew letter Y, represents 6, all right? And remember Y is 10. That's very important to know. And if you look at sigma... Sigma is um is an S, which also relates to stigma slash digamma, which means six. All right. So you take 600 plus 60. And how I got 60 was, remember I told you the yaw uh, equals 10. Okay. And the epsilon letter, which is Y, resemble the yaw. So you take 10 times 9, which is theta. You take 10 times 9, and the 9 comes from theta. You get 90. And when you flip it, you can get 60. Okay? Plus 6 gives you 666. Um, number 2, I'm going to walk you through it. That's the breakdown of the letters. That's in the fish name. Okay? When you look at the epsilon, it's equal Y. And Y is equal to sigma because they have a letter resemblance, S. And S and the letter S resemble the Hebrew letter um, Shem, S-A-M-E-K-H, which is 60. So you can get 60 that way by letter resemblance, okay? Plus 6, we still give you 666, or 6 to the third power equals I-H-S plus theta, which is and theta is 9, and 9 is equal to the letter T, we give you T hyphen IHS, okay? Number three, 
at um the iota the greek letter iota equals i okay which we know tie back to jesus so we look at chai we get 600 theta we can get the cross which is nine or letter t epsilon we're gonna get 60 because of letter resemblance and sigma because of letter resemblance will equal six because of stigma again it's going to tie back to t hyphen ihs which means jesus is t i h s because the iota is listed in the fish name okay right here i want to want to show it to you so you can see what i'm talking about right here it's listed in the fish name let me see can i get yeah elder because that's like separate from all the other ones so when you look at number three what it's saying when you break that down with all the letters it's saying to you hey zeus is t-i-h-t hyphen i-h-s and six to the third power equals six 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 which is the beast name okay which will also tie us back into the greek letters the i the chai, which is X, and this and the stigma, which is iota chai stigma, and that would represent IXS or SXS. So when they're on top of each other, they would form 666. Okay. Take this time to pause your screen to look at that. And I just want to um I, I just want to share with you this picture again this is in christian churches and they acknowledge this okay it's it's pagan all right now most of you are aware that even the pope title equals 666 so take this time to pause your screen the letters hyphen in red is how they was able to get the calculations because those who are familiar with roman numerals would know that the Pope title act on uh, add up to 666. So that's how you get the beast name of 666. Again, the power three. Okay. And here I was talking about Zai with that curvy E with a tail. It represents a, it represents a snake. That's what it represents. It makes sense because the snake is coiling around you, bounding you and keeping you in darkness away from the truth of the most high on this site he mentions that this ancient mysterious egyptian pagan symbol represents the serpent that gives power authority and a throne on the earth to the false messiah who is called god's son okay so remember when um yahushua was taken to the wilderness and he was tempted and he told him I would give you the kingdoms of the world if you bow down to me. See, people don't realize that even Satan has powers. And this is why the only way you can overcome Satan is through Yahushua HaMashiach. You cannot defeat Satan in this flesh. There's no way. Okay. So uh, what I'm going to do in the video description box, I'm going to give you a video to watch and a book a, a book i recommend for you to read to give you more insight about the cross which is represented by the letter t because you're going to learn that this is an ancient symbol that goes back way back to nimrod way back during that time okay now i'm gonna let you know the video that i'm gonna share with you there is some slight difference that i don't totally agree with i was going to talk about to you now but however, it's pretty much on point to give you an understanding that the reason why we don't wear a cross is because it's an instrument of death. OK, and it is a pagan symbol. See, we built our cross spiritually. And this is why we are attacked or why we are fully oppressed, because it is he who dwell in us. So this is how we bear our cross. See, our power do not come from a piece of wood. It comes from Yahushua's spirit. And Yahushua's spirit comes from Yahuwah. That is, that is your power. That is, that is the only way you can overcome this world. Okay? So I'm going to put that in the video description box. 
the pagan origins of the cross. Okay. For most of it, I agree with, but for other, that's, that's a part of it. I don't agree with one piece of information. And then the, the book I recommend you to read is, is the two Babylons by Alexander Hipsop, because then you're going to learn why the cross is a pagan image. It's an idol. And you know what Deuteronomy 5 and Exodus 20 tell us? We are not supposed to, we're not supposed to make any graven images nor bow down to them. And it's best for you not to, and we, we should not be wearing them. Okay. The letter T, the cross, is an ancient Babylonian symbol of the god Tammuz in the days of Nimrod's wife, Samarias. It represents the worship of the snake, the fire, the sun, and sexual organs, and a symbol of the Babylonian sun god. This symbol came into Christian art um, almost 700 years after the death of Yahushua. So this came from this guy's site from Hug Pages. That's where I got this from. Okay. So you might see a slight difference or slight variation with, with the years. Okay. But what he's basically saying that Yahushua believers who are called Messianic Nazarene did not have this symbol. Okay. Now, which brings us to the difference that um that I have that's not in agreement with the video. Okay, we're gonna look at the cross, which is the letter T, which is represented by the X or or cross right here, or T, versus the stake or pole. Okay, take this nine time to pause your screen because we're gonna talk the difference about these two, and come to find out there is scriptures in the Bible that will support what cross Yahushua HaMashiach was, was crucified on. There's evidence. Okay. The most high is not going to leave us hanging like this. And the reason why I'm adding about this, not only me, but my sister had, had, had made a testimony to me about her experience with the cross. And I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about a wooden cross or an idol, but she had a spiritual experience with the father. Okay. That, that confirmed that he was crucified on this cross that we see over here. Okay. And that's the reason for that versus this. Okay. So I already gave away. The answer is the cross that's in the shape of a T. So it's going to be like a lowercase T. And that's the reason. But take a notice that how this body is hanging on the cross because it's more of a Y shape. All right. Remember that. Now, here are some clues to determine what type of cross it was, whether it was a cross in the shape of a T or whether it was a pole. We knew he was alive on the cross from the third hour to the ninth hour, okay, which is very important. Because when most people die on the cross, they die from exhaustion or asphyxiation. And asphyxiation is dealing with breathing and, oxy and, and oxygenation. So looking at these pictures, you know, they, they're in a position where they cannot breathe well, especially when your arms are extended and your legs are bound to the cross. OK. So that's very important to know. Um, these are some Latin words for a cross and a T versus Constantine cross. OK. And a stake is basically a single wood beam. And most of the time they were impaled their victims by that. Okay. And then others um, types of executions devices would be in the shape of an X or Y. All right. Now, another um, evidence that we have that is that a sign has to be over his head. So we look at both of these pictures here. Okay. Maybe, maybe in this one, but definitely in this one. Okay. So a sign would have to be over his head and it was written in Latin, Hebrew, and Greek. So looking at this, it's not that much room. Hmm. Could you look at the person's arm? This would be perfect over here. The cross and shape of a T, lowercase T. But let us keep going. We, we also are aware that his legs were not broken. That's very important to know. But here's the key scripture. In John chapter 20, verse 25, it mentioned not only hands as being pure because we got two hands, but it mentioned nails as being pure. I mean, pure. So when you look at this one, 
this person probably had what one nail maybe you look at it same thing with the foot one nail but with this cross over here this in shape of a t you will have a nail for each hand okay that's something to look at the next clue um someone may look at when you go to the old test when you look at the brass and serpent who was uplift on the pole you may say hey that has to be the type of um device that that um Yahushua was crucified on but when you look at the whole scriptures the whole volume of the book what it's basically saying to you is that the same way the serpent was uplifted up on a pole is the same way Yahushua Hamashiach shall be lifted up on a on a um pole and that pole is a wooden cross okay you'll see what I mean because I know what you're looking at you look at the word pole anybody said no it got to be singular and I'm gonna tell you why we have another verse to look at when you go to Matthew, let me see here, Matthew 26, verse 47, um, and um, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the wrong thing. When you go to Mark 15, verse 27 to 28, and Luke 23 to 33, you will learn there was two, mat two male factors that was on, on both sides of him. And the word said that one was on his right and the other was on his left. This is how we know that his hands were open up wide and spread open. They wasn't put together. Okay. Now, another scripture you can look at, but it's, I cannot really say that it's like a confirmation, but when the people came and got Yahushua, they, they used, they came with, with staves. So it's kind of hard to say if they came with, with beings. So, so when Pontus, um, grant them a judgment to crucify him they would have the beings to crucify him that's kind of hard to say on that so take this time now to pause your screen so you can get those scriptures and take a look at the word staves x y l o n g three five eight six in comparison to the other greek word for um staves g four four six four and then when you look at the hebrew which is h nine o five for one means a stave or branch of the tree. And another Hebrew word is 86086, which means tree, wood, stick, staff, etc. So take this time to bring this up to pause your screen to get those scriptures for that. But here's why I'm really leaning to more of this. Besides the um besides John chapter 20 verse 25 and besides Mark 15 verse 27 and 28 and also read Isaiah 53, verse 12, and Luke 23, verse 33. Besides those really two main things and, and what my sister shared with me about the cross is how his body is positioned on the cross. A Y shape, not an I, but a Y shape. And it's very important because when you look in Hebrew, we know Yod represent hand and it's also represent in the letter y so we have a y shape on a t cross and that hand means power which bring me to take you to the hebrew chart but also i looked up hand in the hebrew and it also translates to yad h3027 and it means power and strength and the question i have for you is who is the strength out of out who is the stretched out arm of Yahuwah in Isaiah chapter 51? That's something that you need to read and do a study on if you haven't watched the videos that was listed on my channel. But that's a mystery behind that. But when you look at the word hand, it means power. And it comes from a Hebrew word, Yah, H3027. And you go to the Hebrew chart of the Paleo Hebrew and you look at Yod, and this is very important. I'm gonna try to I'm gonna try to blow this up. If it let me. Okay. It means a hand close or closing upon. Okay. Comma to work. Comma. A D done. Comma. A finished work. It's very important. So. Your whole body represent the hand overcoming the cross. Because when you learn about the cross, which is in the shape of a T, it represented the son of Satan 
overcoming the power of darkness. Okay. Another proof can be in the book of Nicodemus. And this link will be in the video description box. I believe it's chapter 18 or 19. I can't remember which chapter, but check the video description box. And it will also confirm that the cross was in the shape of a T. Okay. These are just some things I got off of um, Wikipedia. Take this time to read this for yourself. But even in the strong concordance, it would let you know that the cross known as Stardros G4716 is a well-known instrument of most cruel and ignominious Nios punishment borrowed by the Greeks and Romans from the from the Phoenicians. Okay, so they got it from what the Canaanites, the children of Ham. So a cross was to be a severe weapon of torture and death. That's what the cross represents. Which bring me to this one. The cross, a two being wood, was used as a symbol for Tammuz, the son of Satan, and was the same symbol used to kill slash crucify Yahushua Hamashiach, for, for darkness was trying to overcome the light, but fell. This is why, my brothers and sisters, the Messiah left the wooden cross in hell as a sign of victory. For Yahushua overcame death, the grave, Satan, and the world. First Corinthians chapter 15 and Hosea chapter 13 verse 14. So you see, my people, Satan is the prince of death and destruction and of this world that we are living in now. So the only way we can over, uh, overcome him, we have to receive salva salvation and baptism. Because through Yahushua HaMashiach, we can fulfill the law and be not condemned by the law. Okay. And Yahushua HaMashiach blood covers us and the power of the lamb dwell in us. And that power is the fullness of Yahuwah. The spirit of Yahushua HaMashiach. Read Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. Some extra reading you can do in your spare time is 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21 to 25, and Acts chapter 5, verse 29 through 32. Especially that one because it talks about him being how, how he became a prince and his savior unto us. And Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. These are links. Of how the, all the information that you see that I got came from these on um, different websites. But I especially want to put out, you may want to definitely look up classical antiqu antiquity, because there you can find that Rome was founded on April the 21st, 753 BC, by twin descendants of the Trojan prince Aeneas, Romulus, and Remus. Also, on that same site, it will reveal to you that the Latin word rex is the word for kings okay and before we talked about this last picture i want to take you to these photos so you can really stand about the name of the beast so we see why we see freemasons wearing purple and we even have some hebrew israelites who are freemasons who are undercover and appear as one of us, but they're not us. I'm talking about the agents. I'm not talking about their members. I'm talking about the agents. And this is why you see them wear that color purple. Okay. Also in the video description box, there'll be a link on that. So you can see what the agent symbol look like of a grand master. Okay. Right here. This symbol right here. So this is the sunburst image. And you can see they got lights all around it to represent the sun, a sun god, which is Jesus Christos. And we see T represents the nine, which also represents the cross. And the square root of nine is three. So you let me know that he's coming in the power of three. Okay. He would have the powers of Satan. He would be the son of Satan. And he would have the anti-Messiah spirit in him. Okay. And his name is 666, in which we learn what these letters represent, 666. Okay, power three. 
Take this time now to pause your screen to look at this image. Now for the next image, it's the Grand Master symbol. See all that purple? <laughs> See the sun? <laughs> all things the same. Tell you, I don't care where you go, my people. They are everywhere. It all comes in the same route. The Illuminati, the Freemasons, the Jewish people, the um, Roman Catholics, Christianity, even Islam. It has its roots in this too. I'm telling you, it's everywhere. Okay. Um, here is this giving you confirmation. This is a Grand Master Purple Emerald. Okay. And take this time to pause your screen to read on that. This is why we see some undercover Hebrew Israelites wearing purple. Because the garments of Yahushua and, and the saints are white. Those are the garments we're going to be wearing. Not purple. See, they try to use the Bible and say, well, it represents royalty. What it's representing is the anti-Messiah. That's who they call in their king, their ruler. This is why you see some Hebrew Israelites who have the understanding of the Hebrew, who still continue to teach the people to call upon the name Jesus Christos. Because they don't serve Yahuwah and, and Yahushua. They are serving Satan, these agents who have mixed themselves among the Hebrew Israelites. Okay, this is how clever they are. They're, they're very deceptive and they have triangles on their garments. A lot of people miss it, but it's there. They, they, they give you they give you the clues. They give you the hint, but it's up to you to believe for who they truly are. This is a picture of the Pope who's wearing a fish hat. Take this time to pause the symbol again. It's about Dagon worship. And remember, Dagon is the father of Baal, which is the father of the son of Satan. OK, in other words, he is Satan because Dagon represent the dragon. OK, when you think about when you think about how the dragon is an aquatic animal, all right, lives in the sea, living water. And Dagon is the father of Baal, and Baal is the son of Satan. So it all ties in together. Take this time to pause your screen for that picture. We ought to talk about Zai in Greek, how this curvy E with a tail represents the serpent symbol. And that's a picture of that right here. You can see. Remember I was saying there's an image where you have IC on one side and XC on another side of this false Messiah who is crystals. And when you convert the um the chai, the um Zai and the stigma, which which is a Greek letters to represent 666, see how the snake fit right perfectly in. <laughs> <laughs> That's where they get the power from. That old serpent, the dragon, Satan. Mm -hmm. Here's an image here. You take this time to pause the screen to read that paragraph right here. You can see right here, I see XC with a line above and what we talked about earlier. And you see this dove here. It reminds me this dove is this dove represents the anti Messiah spirit. It is the bird of Venus slash Astaroth. OK, that's why you see a dove. I'm telling you, they took the things out of the word and they perverted it for their ill will because they don't have any originality. OK, they copy Yahuwah and Yahushua. And he's and here are the false images of Yahushua. But when you read Daniel chapter seven, I believe Daniel chapter ten, Ezekiel chapter one, uh, Matthew five thirty six, and Revelations one, will prove to you that Yahushua Hamashiach is a Negro. He's a black man. He has woolly hair. His hair is now white, which which today we call gray. And this this is not what the true Messiah looked like. Okay. Same thing with the Hebrew Israelites. They are Negroes. This is why Moses' hand was able to turn from black to leprous as snow. This is why Mary was able to turn from black to leprous as written in Numbers chapter 12. 
I highly recommend that you read Leviticus chapter 13 and chapter 14 to understand leprosy because today they call it albinoism and they call it vertiligo. That's when you see a black person turning white or a black person who was born with no melon and they have either blonde hair, okay, white skin, or they have no melon in their eyes. I'll tell you, all these are false images. Again, we see the IC, the XC, we see what they're doing. OK, and we see how he has hands positioned a certain way. Again, they're telling you who they are. I see the X. You see. The, oh, <laughs> I'm telling you, it matches up with, with the symbols they have put before us. Now, here's the here's the shocker right here. Here's the mark of what that cross <laughs> is talking about or what they do. Now, here's the mission that most people understand about the cross. You have to look at who is making this cross and where it's coming from. When it's coming from the, your your Roman Catholics, your Christian, all them making a cross on your forehead, that is that did not come from Yahuwah. But when Yahushua put his mark on you, you know it is holy, it's a dang, and it's of the Father. That is the difference. And notice in this picture here, don't just cross like more of an upside down cross or an X right here. OK, so you have here in this this picture here in the second picture, Babylonian queen with Mark on her forehead. OK. So when you see them come in the cross, this is how they this is how they fool you. You think they come in to acknowledge what. Yahushua had done, but they're not. See, they come in to serve Tammuz, to serve um, the son of Satan. This is how they're able to, to deceive you. So you think that you're on the same team. Look what they do for Ash Wednesday. How they put an X. Again, we, what we learn about X, it represents anti-Messiah. This is the son of Satan's mark. So you can see how it can come in different forms. It can be an X, a perfect line X, or it can be a lowercase, kind of like close to an upside down T. Mm, mm, mm. Take this time now to pause your screen and to read this because this is all pagan. It's heathen. It's not of the Father. And Ash when is definitely not the Father Holy Day. The Bible tells us what, what his holy days are. Passover, Pentecost. We have Feast of Trumpets. We have um, Jubilee, Shemitah, Day of Atonement, um, Feast of Tabernacles. He tells you what his holy days are. Mm. Okay, let's bring us to this last picture right here. I want to show this picture of Mesros again because another video, I think I was not too quite clear. But what this saying that's written in Latin, it says, it says to the unconquered son, Atimatus, slave of ours emperors, cashier of the farm of Romaniani. OK, and we know soul means sun, which is right here. So we have soul over here to the right. Luna is moon and that's over to the left. And notice how you see X's to represent stars. OK, and then below Mr. This is Miss Mr. Let's skip forgetting my tongue. Has that little funny hat below him. He's wrestling a bull and you see a dog and then you see the, the snake licking up the blood. Right down here, here go the snake. <laughs> and this is in the Roman Vatican Museum. I tell you, this is why I'm definitely not a Christian. I am a Masonic Nazarene, okay? A, mas a Mashigakim Nazarene. That's who I am. I don't follow this mess. And if you know that Mr., when you look at his hat, it resembles the Egyptians. For example, when you see, make sure I got her right name. When you see Iris, which is to the left, the horns represent that she's a queen. And this disc represents the sun, the sun disc. Okay. On the outer um, right, I'm sorry, Iris is to the right. And on the outer left is, um, make sure I got this right. From the right to the left, you got, okay. And, and the outer left is 
Horace, her son, that that she birthed. Um, well, her was. I'm sorry. The one to the outer left is Horace, which is their son. Okay. Notice, look at the hair attire. Okay. Can you see the serpent come out of it? Because that's where the power is coming from. And in the middle is Osiris. Okay. And look at Osiris' hat. It looks a lot like Mistress hat. Also look at um, Horace hat. And he's represented again by a bird. Hmm. Ties in a lot. Anti-Messiah spirit. You got this funny looking hat that looks like Mistress. Right here. Okay. Take this time to pause your screen and to get that saying there. Now we're going to look at these last few pictures. The rest of this we have already talked about before. So we're going to keep scrolling on down. And I do want to pause this because I did make some updates to... Jesus. The thing I did want to point out is the meaning of Tammuz's name. It's the reason they call him the Sprout of Light because this is why they have tree worship. This is why you see Christians having Christmas and the Christmas tree. It's a den, again it's dealing with vegetation, having a fruitful crop, those things. This is why you see uh, Ahaz and his wife Jezebel worship, worship trees or have tree groves. When you read First Kings chapter 16, we I recommend read chapter 16 all the way throughout. It's very interesting to see how they worship Baal, okay, which is the son of Satan, which is also Tammuz. But when you look up Tammuz, it means the sun who rises also interpret as the faithful sun. So that's why you often see him equated to trees or also equated as a sun god, okay? Uh, another thing I added, I didn't have in the last video, was this, the other variation um, names of Jesus, and which is often tied into, I'm not going to try to say that, it's I-A-S-I-U-S. -S. So take this time now to pause your screen. Again, this is just confirming that Jesus Christos is not the Messiah, okay? So what I'm going to do is, um, in the video description box, I'm going to post some instructions on how you can get your copy of what of what was put together in this video so you can you know do a further study and don't have to worry about writing down every single little thing and that way you can take your time because this is a lot of information to observe all at once and to understand how do you get 666 out of t-i-h-s okay The thing I do want to emphasize the most, and this symbol came out of a Roman Catholic church, which is the church of Jesus. Okay. That's where it comes from. Come from them. This stuff is not made up. It's evident. All we have to do is look it up. Okay. This is what I want to bring out. When you see with Jesus or Tammuz, they're always worshiped with some type of queen or mother. And these are the false images of the so-called Virgin Mary, who is actually named is the Madonnas, and it comes in black or white. But believe it or not, in the European countries, they worship a black image of the Madonna, who is so called, um, quote unquote, the Virgin Mary. And I wanted, um, I was able to go that smaller picture so you can really see this is what they worship. Okay, this is what they have behind closed doors that we don't see in America. All right. So take this time now to pause your screen and I'm going to let you know just because you see a black image, that is not Miriam who is Mary and that is not Yahushua Hamashiach. This is representing Tammuz and his, um, and his mother, Queen Samaria, who is the queen of Babylon. This is also a representation of Astaroth and Baal. Okay. Again, you have the son of Satan, with his mother. That's what this is represented. 
Now you now you begin to understand why the Bible tell us not to make any graven images or nor to worship them or have them. It's for a reason, because the father knew what the enemy would do. So I want you to take this time now to pause your screen because this is proof for me telling you that it is in the European countries and that's what they worship. OK, in America, they give us the right version because they don't want you to know that the children of Yash Yashua'el is are Negroes. They don't want you to know that they are truly black. Mm -hmm. Tell you lies upon lies. All right, my fam, I know this video was was in was deep. If you like me, when I was first reading about this and studying about this, my head was swimming, <laughs> swimming. <laughs> okay. Getting to the end. Here's a better picture of Mistress with the head I was telling you about earlier. Here we go. Here go another one. So it comes from the Egyptians with, with Horus. Mm -hmm. And their powers come from Satan. The power of three. Okay. All right. So these videos going to be in the um, description box so you can do a further study. I highly recommend that you watch these videos because there's some deep mysteries in the King James 1611 Bible. And the father is sharing these mysteries with us now because he wants us to know the truth. It's time for us to come out of darkness and into the light. It's time for us to know his truth. And to depart from the lies that the word gave us. Okay. Also, there will be a link to my Facebook note to give you access to the sources that I use in part one and part two. And again, I'll, I'll put uh, instructions in the video description box on how to get a copy of this um of this document with the breakdown, the Hebrew and the um, Greek words that we just talked about. Okay. And with the beast name as well. So it'll probably be under Facebook notes and under links. So look for that area in the video description box. And this bring us to the end of this lesson. Okay. You know me, I got to get my music. Okay, so this brings us to the end now. The name doctrine, the breakdown, the square root of the beast name, the T I H S crystalgram slash monogram of the Roman Catholic Church, giving you understanding on why I'm not a Christian. For Christianity is a pagan religion of the Sunday worshippers, the Sunday keepers. So now you understand why it's so important to understand the origin of words in the King James 611 Bible. So you can expose the deception that is there. Take this time now to pause your screen to look at these images again. For we learned that the T-I-H-S uh, square root is three because T equals nine. It is representing the anti-Messiah. That's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 17 through 18. And it is the Christian symbol. The, the cross, which is the letter T hyphen I H S, which represents the sun God, the Christos, the six, 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 which is the name of the beast, the um, and the name of the anti Messiah, the darkness powers of three and the color purple, the sunburst T I H S crystalgram, the beast name six, six, six. Okay. Now Yahuwah is revealing his truth to his children for it's time for us to wake up and to stand for him and to share this truth with others for mankind is, is at war with Satan, his angels, and with their followers. As we can see, it does matter to Yahuwah, the Most High El, on what name we do use for it is confirmed in Exodus chapter 23 verse 13. Take this time now to pause your screen to look at this verse. So this is why my family, a new name shall be given in the new kingdom because the world, including some of the Hebrew Israelites has profaned the father and the son, holy names by giving false doctrines, false names and lies 
and by not keeping his commandments, the covenant, and by representing Yahuwah and Yahushua, or coming in their name as wolves in sheep clothing, bearing the fruits of the anti-Messiah spirit. They are giving the Father, the Son, a bad name, a bad reputation among the children of Adam, which pushes the masses away from believing and worshiping Yahuwah, the Father, and from giving honors to Yahushua's sacrifice and gift to mankind, Adam. The Father and the Son, reputation is messed up because of them. Also, they are making their followers to become the children of hell, filled with the false doctrines of men. And these children are the twofold more worse than those devils that created them. Read Matthew chapter 23, verse 13 through 15, and chapter 15, verse 7 through 9. So my brothers and sisters, do not be a hypocrite like the Pharisees and scribes we see today. And last but not least, take this time to read this paragraph here. For we are Mashiachim, Nazarene, Nazrim, which means Masonic Hebrew Israelites. And we follow the Lamb, Yahushua HaMashiach. I close out with this prayer. I plead the blood of Yahushua HaMashiach upon this video post and the links attached to this post. Yahuwah, I ask you that if anyone tries to stop this truth, that you afflict an evil judgment upon them until they repent and do what is right in the sight of your eyes. Also, Father, I pray that your truth go throughout the four corners of the earth and that you give your people understanding for those who want it. In the name of, of Yahushua HaMashiach, so be it. So my family, continue to preach the gospel that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is the season for Yahushua HaMashiach to return, who is the Messiah, the anointed one of Yahuwah, the king of kings and the master of masters. Make sure the people receive salvation as written in Romans chapter 10 and baptize them in the name of Yahushua HaMashiach. For the lamb, his disciples slash apostles did confirm the water baptism as written in Mark chapter 16, verse 14 to 20, John chapter 3, Acts chapter 2, chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 11, chapter 16, and chapter 19. So this concludes everything, my family. I love you all and share this truth with everyone. And remember to have patience with them as the Father had patience with us. For it's time to stir this world up. It's time to get his truth out. I love you all and shalom.